So, another thing that we also have to talk about is the use of IR spectra to study organometallic compounds. What makes a difference between organometallic compounds and um, metal complexes? In metal complexes, the metal is coordinated to an atom that serves as an electron donor. But in organometallic compound, the metal is not coordinated to an electron donor atom. So you can have an example of that to be that when you have F and you have that's pentacarbonate, when you have ion pentacarbonate, so you have this, you have this, and you have this, and you have this. So this, we have iron as a central metal, but now the iron here is not coordinated to the oxygen, which is the normal electron donor. And don't forget, we said that ligand should be able to donate electron pair into the empty, into the d orbital of a metal. So, but in organometallic compound, that's not so. It's not the electron donor that is coordinated to the metal, but rather it's the carbon atom which is not an electron donor. So this is an example of an organometallic compound involving carbonase. So, and that is what we want to look at, that how do we use IR spectrum to also um, describe organometallic compound like this. So, but in the case whereby you have that the coordinated atom to the metal are electron donors, then you have your normal metal complex. So for compound as this, that is this organometallic compound now, the position of carbonyl can always differ in different organometallic compounds. There are some organometallic compounds where carbonyl um, functional group, where the carbonyl is free or is at the terminal end. There are also some um, organometallic compound where the carbonyl is serving as a bridge. So you can have these three different scenario for an organo metal for carbonized in an organo metallic compound. So you can have it, you can have a free carbonyl like this where it is terminal. As we have it in this case, you can see that all these carbonyl here are terminal. Or we can also say they are what they are free. So you can have it like this also, whereby you're having two metal and then carbonyl is serving as a bridge between them. That is when carbonyl is serving as a bridge between two. I can also have a case whereby carbonyl is serving as a bridge between even three, between three metals. So you have a metal, another metal, you have another metal, so they are together and carbonyl is in, in the midst of them together with his single word, with single O. So carbon is serving as a bridge between what between this between the three metals in this particular case. So you can have carbon like this, you can have it this, you can have, so in these two carbon is serving as a bridge, while in this one carbon is what is terminal or you can say they are free. So how does higher spectrum of this um, of this um, carbonite different? Now for terminal um, of free carbonyl in a in an organometallic compound. The signal for a free carbonyl in the IR spectrum for a for an organometallic compound is always intense and very sharp, and it's always between two thousand one hundred and one thousand eight or one thousand eight fifty. That is where you can see signal for free or terminal carbonate. When the higher is for an organometallic compound. But when you have carbonate serving as a bridge, whether between, between two metals or between two, three metals, the vibrational frequency of the carbonate reduces and um, it, is all, it is usually around 1,850 and 1,750. At the same time, the signal for bridging carbonyl is always broad and at the same time very weak compared to the signal for the free carbonyl. So in a way, they can give us, um, they can ask, they can give us an organometallic compound and 
ask us to determine what or to predict the vibrational frequency of different carbonides that are present in that particular organometallic compound. I've talked about how you can make a difference between the two when it is free and when it is serving as a bridging. They can also give us an higher spectrum of an organometallic compound and to determine the nature of carbonides that are present within that particular organometallic compound, whether they are what, whether they are free or whether they are bridging. So depending on where you have the signal, where you have signals for carbonite determines what kind of the, what kind of carbon what types of carbonite are present in the given um, in the given um, organometallic compound that the IR spectrum represents. So uh, so please take note of this as well so that in case if questions also comes out in this particular regard we would also be able to solve it. So carbonized in an organometallic compound can be free and it can be what? It can be bridging. So it can serve as a bridge between two metals or even between three metals. But the vibrational frequency, like I said, of the carbonate in this case is different from what you have in this particular case. And this is how to use IR spectrum for um, studying of organometallic Compound. And this will be the end of I of um, of the use of high house of the use of I have um, spectroscopic techniques in the study of metal complex together with organometallic compound. In the picture shown to you, it contains a table um, of data that were gotten after a comparison between a, the IR of a complex at the same, of a metal complex after coordination reaction has occurred and of the ligand before coordination um, before coordination reaction of course so if you look if you do if you look at if you if you do a kind of comparison between um, between the two you will see that initially there was in the two before and after there was presence of OH signal which is around 3485. Now when you look at the next when you look at the next column you will see that they also check for the signal for what for n single bond h which is around 3000 3, which is around 3242. But after coordination has occurred the um, signal for nh was absent and that's why they put a dash there now if you also look at the next column you will see that they check for the signal for c double bond o before coordination and after coordination in the two ir spectrum and there was c double bond o signal before coordination but after coordination there was no longer c double bond o signal now the two um the absence of nh signal and absence of c double bond o signal after coordination reaction has, after coordination reaction occurred suggests that probably suggests that the given um, the given the ligand within that particular um, within that particular formed complex has lost the carbonized signal functional group at the same time as lost the NH from um, bond 2. And that might suggest that probably the protonation has occurred in the ligand. If the ligand is something like, uh, like, I, like I said, if it is probably an hydrazone. So you can have a deprotonation that will, lo that will lead to the loss of carbonyl, um, your C double bond O signal and N single bond H signal so they also check for other um, other functional group, like i said the c single bond o c um now it, it, to, to establish what we said if you look at the table shown in the picture you will see that c single bond o was absent um in the in the ir spectrum for the ligand before coordination but it was present which confirms the fact that um, deprotonation truly occurs, whereby carbonyl C double bond O changes to C single bond O. So you can see in that same picture that they also check for other um, other bonds that were that can serve as a way of um, or as a way to study the metal complex um, before 
um, reaction, coordination reaction occur and after the um, coordination reaction has occurred. Also in that table also you will see them um, highlighting the signal for M, uh, metal to oxygen at the same time metal to nitrogen which are only present after coordinate which are only present in the IR spectrum for the metal complex after coordination reaction has occurred so and that's how to go about when you are given an high house spectrum. you might have to create a table one um, one um, the, each of the column will be for different signals you are trying to bring out of the given IR spectra at the same time you will have two rows in the table whereby one for the ligand before the coordination reaction occur and one for the complex after that is formed after the coordination reaction has occurred and you try to um, bring out um, those particular signal for each of the bonds that you have highlighted in your table at the same time try to use the differences um, the differences in the signal you got for um, for the IR before coordination reaction and the higher that, that you got after coordination reaction and try to use the differences to uh, to make inference about the given complex and that's how to go for the use of high out to study um, meta complexes at the same time also like i said for um, organo metallic compound the last um, spectroscopic technique which i'm going to be talking about is the mass spectro metry in the analysis of um, metal complexes. From our basic knowledge, we know that mass spectrometry involves um, bombarding of molecules with electron in order to eject just in order to eject one electron from the molecule to form a molecular ion. So when you bombard molecules with electrons, um, Elect when you when you bombard um, molecules with a beam of electron, electron can be ejected from that molecule to form molecular ion, and the molecular ion can further disintegrate to give different fragment ion, which are detect which have different mass and can be detected by the um, by the detector of the mass spectrometer. So and that's the basic um, under um, that's the basic principle. Under mass spectrometry, so we are saying that this can also be applied in the study of um, of metal complexes. And for the fact that metal themselves they are highly electropositive, it means that it is more easy for metal to become ionized because the process I've described now is a process of ionizing and then um, then you having a fragmentation. So metal can easily be can easily be ionized compared to organic molecules because metal can lose electron they can even some can even lose more than two electrons to become ions the um, electropositivity of the metal which are present in the metal um, complex which are present in metal complexes um, give it a high possibility of forming a molecular ion which makes it possible for us to be able to use the principle of mass spectrometry in analyzing um, metal complexes. So, in the mass spectrometry of metal complexes, the fragmentation that occurs after ionization of the of the metal complex to form molecular ion, the fragmentation that occurs are very are always predictable, and the major um, the major um, way of fragmentation of metal complexes of metal complexes under um, mass spectrometry is given thus that metal with ligand you know in a complex you have metal and uh, and ligand that has formed a radical cation so this is what you have after uh, so this is the molecular ion that is formed after ionization when you have bombarded the, uh, the metal complex with a single electron you form molecular ion so we are saying that the molecular ion can always there is um the, the fragmentation of this molecular ion is predictable in the sense that when you have a metal 
a radical meta complex like this after ionization, then this can fragmentize. This should fragmentize to give us M L L minus one plus L dot. You know, we said that if you remember under mass spectrometry, we said when a molecular ion undergo fragmentation, it is major. It is going to give us. It is. It is going to produce a cation and a radical. That is, a cation must be produced because the mass spectrometer can only detect a cation. So we are saying that when a metal com when a radical metal complex disintegrates or fragmentizes, it's going to give us a cation and a radical. So, but it is always the ligand that goes as a radical. So please take note when you are doing your fragmentation of the metal complex radical cation. It must be that the ligand is what is going as a radical, not the metal. So the metal cannot go as a radical because the metal is highly ionizable, or let me say it, it is easily ionizable. So in a way, so when I have, so M here is the metal, L here is the ligand, while N here is the number of ligands that you have in the, um, in the, um, in the, metal complex radical cation. So if this metal complex radical cation undergoes fragmentation, it's going to give us this cation where one of the ligand has been removed. That's why we have ligand N minus one. So if you have, let's say you have like, we have five ligands here in this place. So by the time fragmentation occurs, this becomes M, the metal and L4. And then one of the L has gone away as a radical. So you can have something like this. So this is not possible. That you can have M dots. So you can have M L N minus one dots. And you have L plus. So the ligand cannot go as a cation. But what you always have is this together with this. So an example of that can be seen in this particular compound called ferrocene. This is the structure of the ferrocene. This, comp this, this ring structure is a cyclopentadiene, and this also is another cyclo. So in the structure of ferrocene, you are having one, um, last you are having an ion meta, and we are having two molecules of cyclopentadiene. So this coordinated to all the carbons. So this, we can say, in this case, an, an example of, um, is in a way, we can say, yes, to all the carbon. Yes, and that's why we're having this particular symbol there. We symbolize the fact that the ion is um, coordinated to all the five, um, the five carbons. That's what this is telling us. So, but the point there is that when, if I have, a, an organometallic compound like this, or so let's say, yes, it, it is an uh, example of an organometallic compound. If I have an organometallic compound like this, that is that I'm to analyze with um, mass, uh, what's it called now, with mass, with mass spectrometry. So the point there is that the first thing that happens is that this thing will form a radical cation because that's the first thing. You must bombard the molecule with electron to form a radical cation. So in that case, you are going to have this um, Fe and we have this and we have C5H5. We have two and we have plus dots. So this will be a radical cation. So when this now undergoes fragmentation, so, there, so that now, since this is a radical cation, so there will be a signal for this. So you expect that there will be a signal for this in the mass spectrum. So there will be a signal for this radical cation in the world, in the mass spectrum, because in a way, to some extent, it's stable. Because due to the, due to the presence of metal in this particular um, product. So at the same time, when this radical cation or the molecular ion now undergoes now undergoes um, fragmentation. So what we're trying to say there is that the product from this thing would be that, you know, here we have two of this, um, of this cyclopentadiene. So we have two of it here. We have two of it here. So by the time this integration occurs, one of this ligand will go. And then the next product we're not going to have will go to be Fe. And we have mu5. And we have C5H5. We have this, and we have it comes. This comes as a cation 
then we are going to have plus c so we are still going to have our this five and we have c5 h5 as a word as a so one of these ligand here we come out one of these ligand here we come out as a radical that you have it why this one will remain we will do or will remain as a cation so the one the side that has the uh, the meta is the one that remains as the cation why the other side goes as a word as a radical so there will also be a signal for this particular product so you can get where the signal will be that just calculating the mass of this particular thing that you have because like we said in the previous video that a mass spectrometer can only detect positively charged products so the mass photon can give, will give a signal for this it will give, give a signal for this because this is a radical cation it will also give a signal for this so this one can also undergo fragmentation and then we can have fe in brackets this five and we have c5 h5 and we have um and we have plus so this can also break down to give us fe plus and then we have um this and we have c5 h5 we have cyclo and we have our, cy our, our cyclopenta Dynamic. So this one we come out. So from this from this particular um, um, organometallic compound, we are going to have this radical cation, which is the molecular ion. So in a way, that would be our world. that would be the parent peak. So that would be the molecular ion peak. So this one will give us a peak because it is a it's positively charged. This also will give us because this is a fragment from this, but it's positively charged. So this one also will produce a signal in the mass spectrum. At the same time, when by the time this one disintegrates, it will give us this um, Fe plus. It will give us Fe plus, that is the meta ion. At the same time, we together with what? With this other ligand as a radical. So we are going to have a signal for this, a signal for this, and a signal for this. This Fe plus is a stable, to some extent, is a stable halon because the metal, so metal can easily lose electrons. So in the spectrum, in the mass spectrum of this particular organometallic compound, you are going to have three signals: one for this molecular halon, one for this fragment, and also one for this fragment. But like I said, the basic rule for the fragmentation of complexes, of metal complexes, or even metal organometallic compound is this. So, but this, like I said, is the what is the molecular ion of the this is the molecular ion of the complex itself or even the organometallic compound. So, but the um, molecular ion can also undergo fragmentation by this rule. That when you have MLN, where M is your meta and L is the ligand, and this small L is the number of ligands. L is the number of what of ligands. You can also term it can also be referred to as the coordination number. So when MLN disintegrates or undergoes fragmentation, it will always give us the this product. And we said that it is whatever preside that is with the whatever ligand that is with the metal, we carry the positive charge. And that's how the process continues until you get to the world to the meta. So if they give you any organometallic compound, this is what they expect you to apply to get all possible signals that will to to, to predict all possible signals that will be in the met in the in the mass spectrum of that organometallic compound or that particular metal complex. With this, I believe that I'll be able to take you through um, different spectroscopic techniques that are used in the analysis of metal complexes at the same time organometallic compound. If you have any question, um, comments or suggestion, you can always drop it for me in the comment section. And if you also have anything that you are unclear about, you can try to reach out to me through the WhatsApp platform. I would be glad to respond to your questions and comment on this particular video. Thank you for watching and thank you for being on this particular channel. At the same time, I also want to remind you that you can help us to share this video with your colleagues and friends 
home and abroad that you know this video can be of help to them and I don't just watch you also have to subscribe so as you watch please don't forget to click the subscribe button and also if possible the notification button thank you for watching this video i hope for your comment and also for your suggestion thank you and don't forget to subscribe to this channel